One of the benefits of being at Mises University is being able to do what you were just doing that I had to stop you from doing, which is making connections with other students. And that is one of the most valuable things you can do here. Because if you're anything like me when I was an undergrad student, the um, libertarian movement among students wasn't nearly as well developed as it is today but you still probably feel somewhat isolated. Maybe that's not true now, but um, it's, it's encouraging to get together with a bunch of other students who think like you do and to make these connections, sometimes international connections, and, and these are connections that will stick with you, in some cases, the rest of your life. And that's a really wonderful thing. It's an intangible benefit apart from anything that we can tell you in our presentations this week. So. I encourage you to keep doing that, exchange emails or Instagram, whatever you do now, I don't know, I uh, can't keep up. <laughs> Every other year it's a new social medium. Um, without wasting time, because uh, I, I only have 45 minutes, I'd like to move through this. And before I start, I don't think this will be too far off topic here for me to discuss just a, a couple of minutes about how I got interested in free market economics in general and then became aware of the Austrian school. And the, one of the primary influences on me in that regard was a non-economist, the man in the center of that picture there who's my father. He died in 2009. He was an unusual physician in that he was very interested in economic issues. He had a framed... Um, display on his office wall uh, of a number of defunct fiat currencies. He loved to talk to people about the, um, the crimes of the Fed and how terrible medical licensure was and how the FDA was a cartel of large pharmaceutical companies and, and all of these things. And so he was very interested in economics. That's what we talked about around the dinner table. And um, at his death in 2009, he was the president-elect of a very free market-oriented doctor's organization called the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons. And I may refer to one or two of their um, items off their website um, here in this presentation, but it's a great organization. Uh, they're very aware of the uh, Austrian school and some of the work that has been done um, that's emanating from this building, from the Mises Institute. A lot of people, I went out to uh, talk to uh, a group of doctors at the annual AAPS meeting in Denver a couple of years ago, and, and if I mention uh, you know, Mises or Hayek or something or Rothbard, they're, oh yeah, 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 we, you know, they, they've read all of this, they know um, where I'm coming from. So it's an encouragement to me to see that that is a moving force in uh, American medicine, and that, that is uh, being influenced by the kind of work that, um, that the Mises Institute does and other free market-oriented um, institutions. I'd like to start off with a quote here from F.A. Hayek. One of his most famous articles that came out in 1945, The Use of Knowledge in Society, uh, uh, was very influential on me. My father um, and I wrote a, an article together where we looked at medical care and, and medical bureaucracy from the perspective of uh, Hayek's article. And Hayek says, in part, the sort of knowledge with which with which I have been concerned is knowledge of the kind which by its nature cannot enter into statistics and therefore cannot be conveyed to any central authority in statistical form. This is being forgotten in medical care today and I think that it's worth spending a few minutes looking at the implications of that neglect of that observation. Can the quality of a doctor-patient encounter be judged by a distant authority that does not have the knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place. 
Conco and Arnett in a 2008 article say that um, every day thousands of physicians and patients make myriad choices from available drug options. They take into account differences in effectiveness, side effects, and drug interactions for each individual patient. In fact, there's uh, another dimension that's often neglected even, even in this uh, paragraph here. What, what happens if the patient doesn't take the drug or won't, won't take the drug as prescribed, but might take too little or too much or take it sporadically or something? Uh, that has to be taken into consideration as well, and that's something the doctor sitting in the examining room with the patient is in a position to find out, not somebody hundreds of miles away or thousands of miles away trying to look over the doctor's shoulder remotely. Conco and Arnett talking about the FDA say that the FDA scientists may know a lot about the drugs they evaluate and their average effects on thousands of users, but they know nothing about the individualized physiology of each patient. On the other hand, intensively trained clinical physicians who do have knowledge of individual patients are best able to advise them if a drug is appropriate. Now, if you take medical care and you try to scale it upward with the doctor-patient relationship being scrutinized by distant managers, you take on certain risks. We'll talk in a minute um, about coding, medical coding, CPT coding, current procedural terminology, um, and uh, that, that misses a lot of important information in the effort to condense what's happened in that examining room to a alphanumeric code of some kind. And you send that code off to an evaluator who's going to try to determine whether this doctor has committed some kind of Medicare fraud or something of that nature, insurance fraud perhaps, by miscoding. Um, so doctors who are forced to choose between compliance with these centrally imposed standards or meeting the needs of the patient in front of them have a very difficult predicament. What are they going to do? Are they going to actually help this patient or are they going to do something that is going to satisfy the distant bureaucrat? So conscientious doctors in some cases will creatively bend or even break the rules to help patients. So the penalties imposed by the government for breach of their regulations become absolutely draconian. They have to, if they expect to maintain any kind of um, adherence to these regulations, they have to terrorize doctors and other medical professionals with the threat of losing their medical license and, and fines and, and even jail time for, um, for their errors or um, mistakes. An older study, this is from 15 years ago, but this was done by that organization I mentioned earlier, the AAPS. The survey of doctors found that the Medicare system's structure made fraud easy and unintentional errors virtually unavoidable. In fact, just last month, there was a, uh, uh, a, another crackdown on uh, uh, doctors who were allegedly miscoding or defrauding uh, Medicare. The bureaucracy is so labyrinthine, uh, so difficult to understand, the regulations are so difficult to comprehend that uh, doctors um, can't, get, can't get their heads around what's, what's required of them. A 2002 study revealed that 85% of the time Medicare customer, customer, don't you love this? Customer service representatives gave the wrong answer to questions posed by physicians regarding the proper way to bill Medicare. So you're the doctor. You want to follow the law, not lose your license, not go to jail, not be fined, etc. What do you do? Well, who should I ask to interpret the law? How about those people who are charged with enforcing it? So I call them. And 85% of the time, they give me the wrong answer. So Medicare said, we will do better. 2004, 96% of the time, 
Medicare customer service representatives gave the wrong answer. Now, it's almost as though you could, if you're the doctor, you call Medicare, and then you do the opposite of whatever they said, because that's more likely to be right. <laughs> I don't know. But the Medicare policies and regulations were so confusing that even those people who were supposed to be experts in this did not understand what the regulations were saying. And if you can't expect, if the regulators don't know what the regulation says, how is the doctor or the doctor's staff expected to know this? Ludwig von Mises, in one of his great uh, shorter works, Bureaucracy, which came out in 1944, said that government must be formalistic and rigid by its nature. If you don't want formalistic rigidity, get the government out of that activity because it's an inevitable consequence of government involvement. So the core problem, he said, is a lack, the lack of a measure of success and failure. I'm um, using uh, another one of his works, uh, Profit and Loss, which is available online as a PDF and an ebook on the Mises site for something else I'm working on. And, and uh, Mises points out in that uh, work that it's uh, profit and loss that serve as the measurement tool, the feedback, for the entrepreneur to get information about what should be done with the available resources. Bureauc uh, bureaucracy doesn't have that. There's a great article that just appeared, I think it was early last week, on the, on the Mises website on, as a Mises Daily. And I've got the uh, address down here if you want to look it up yourself. And uh, Michelle Akkad uh, is the author. Um, and the article has this wonderful diagram showing the growth of physicians and administrators over the last several decades. You can see the physician growth in, uh, I, that's a blue or green down there at the bottom, you barely see it. And then the red is the growth of um, administrators since 1970. Now, I, I, this sparks a little curiosity. I'm going to have to look this up to see if there's a similar diagram for higher education. Growth of professors versus growth of administrators. I think I might find the same kind of thing. And in both cases, higher education and in medical care, we see the same phenomenon, increased governmental involvement. Now, I'm going to read, I'll beg your patience, but I'm going to read a bit here from that article because I can't say it any better than Akkad did. It is particularly noteworthy that that graph, which I just showed you, by the way, that graph was generated by a group that um, wants more government involvement in medical care because they think somehow that if the government's involved more, then that administrator, over-administrator, over-bureaucratized problem is going to be diminished. So this is, this is, if I may digress for a moment, this is typical of statists. <laughs> oh, look at this problem that's created by what they advocated and enacted before. We need more government to solve the problem created by more government. It's never enough regulation. Anyway, so Akkad says, it is particularly noteworthy that this graph depicts the administrative workforce as shooting up in the early 1990s, for it is around that time that payment for medical services would become highly dependent on a Byzantine scheme of codification invented precisely to convey to central authorities in charge of health insurance crucial information about what is taking place in the privacy of medical offices within the confines of operating rooms or at hospital bedsides. In 1992, with the passage of the Medicare fee schedule, use of this coding system became mandatory. From then on, clinical care would be spoken in the lingua franca of CPT, ICD, and EM codes and the term documentation would take on a bitter significance for doctors. But translating the what, how, and why of local medicine into cryptic ciphers for remote bureaucrats does not make the business of healthcare any more intelligible 
to the central planner, regardless of whether the codes are transmitted by an archaic fax machine or digitized and made immediately accessible by means of mandatory electronic health records systems, which I object to, by the way, not because I'm a technophobe, but because I don't want any technology available to a bureaucracy that would make it easier for them to oppress doctors and by extension, their patients. Codes and data, of course, are not knowledge. Hayek's shipper engaging in tramp trade, and you, if you read the um, uh, Hayek article that I mentioned earlier, you'll recognize that, that Hayek was pointing out that that shipper has the knowledge of the circumstances of time and place, knows where there's some spare room on a freighter and can fill that with something that he happens to know is sitting on the dock waiting for shipment. But no centralized bureaucrat a thousand miles away would be able to put two and two together and make that connection. Only the person there on the spot. Only that sh uh, shipper can make a judgment about the significance of empty spots on a boat because the context associ associated with that information elicits meaning based on which he acts. Last segment, in contrast, a CPT code 99204-21, new patient visit, EM coding level four, prolonged service associated with ICD-9 code 786.50, chest pain unspecified, hardly contains any real knowledge and cannot possibly be a basis on which relevant decisions can be made or value established. The only tangible effect of the coding scheme is simply to require a massive influx of administrators charged with interpreting and acting upon its obscure data signals. Let's talk a little bit about rising costs. Now, um, there are several reasons that we might, uh, might uh, think are attached to these uh, rising medical care costs in the United States. By the way, there has been a bit of a pause uh, over the last several years in the increase in these medical costs, uh, but over the long term, they've been rising. Now, there are several reasons for this. I think one is uh, employer-provided health insurance, so you have a third party. Now, why did employers start paying or start providing health insurance to their employees? Well, taxes were rising. In fact, in 1943, they were very high. Marginal tax rates were well, they were going up so fast, I don't know, it probably depends on which part of 1943 you're talking about. This is World War II. Tax rates topped out by the end of the war at 90-something percent, the marginal, top marginal tax rate. So if you want to provide some compensation to employees, if you could provide them something like medical insurance that is pre-tax, um, then and they're not taxed on the value of that insurance, then it's a way of providing the employee with something... Um, uh, much more valuable than, say, giving the employer $10, $10 additional dollars, and having nine of them disappear before the employer sees the money in the paycheck. So employer-provided health insurance is really a function of uh, marginal tax rates that were rising in 1943. And now we've, we've become attached to this idea that if you don't have insurance, well, you must not have medical care, um, which is not true. Um, then licensure, medic, uh, occupational licensure, um, which restricts entry into the medical profession. Now, I'm happy to see that there has been some weakening of this as uh, nurse practitioners gain prescribing privileges and other medical specialties emerge that can do uh, a lot of what doctors can do. And so, therefore, doctors are seeing a contracting of the sphere over which they have this kind of monopolistic control. Um, the licensure system is indirectly managed by doctors themselves. Um, they uh, make sure that you can't get a license from the state government unless you go through a particular uh, kind of medical school that's accredited by a doctor's organization. And the doctor's organization makes sure that the medical schools limit their seating, their, their, the number of students they admit, so that they're essentially putting a bottleneck on uh, new doctors coming into the medical profession. So licensure is a way of restricting entry 
and uh, it makes medical care harder to get, which is, this is one of the reasons why if you go see a typical doctor, you're gonna spend maybe five minutes and uh, the doctor will scribble out some kind of prescription and, and you'll be on your way. You hardly have a conversation with this person. Um, uh, Boyapati also mentions the obesity epidemic and intellectual property as contributors to these rising costs. The one I wanna focus on here is the problem of intermediaries. A third party interposed between the patient and the care provider, doctor, the nurse, the nurse practitioner, whoever that person happens to be. So the doctor begins to work for the satisfaction of the regulators and the third party payers rather than for the patient. Now, there are several problems that emerge when you put this group of institutions, which could be insurance companies, could be government, um, when you put that group of institutions in between the doctor and the patient. Now, um, with any third party payer, you get a couple of problems. One is moral hazard, which is the risk or hazard that the insured person might engage in activities that are undesirable or immoral in a way of speaking, that's why we call it moral hazard, uh, from the insurer's point of view because they make it more likely the claims will be larger. So for example, if I have car insurance and I know that if my car is damaged then I will be mostly compensated for that damage, I may be more likely to park my car on the street where it can get sideswiped instead of parking it in my driveway maybe a little less likely to run out and pull my car into my garage if a hailstorm threatens, a little more likely to forget and leave my keys in the car and have it stolen, et cetera. That's the case with most insurance. Then there's the principal agent problem, where those who are charged with acting on behalf of the, in this case, the patient or the principal, that's the person who wants something done, I want to get my health back, have their own sometimes incompatible agendas and objectives. Now, one of the things that we notice is that where insurance is a larger fraction or where government payment is a larger fraction of the payment for the medical procedure, the costs go up faster. And where insurance is less a part of the picture, costs go up more slowly. So we can see that here. This is from an NCPEA um, essay by Devin Herrick. Uh, and you can see several component or several uh, pieces here. One is medical care in general, which since 1992 up to, uh, up to uh, 2012 went up by 118%. Physician services went up by 92%. Inflation in general, 64% over that time period. Uh, but cosmetic services only went up by 30%. Now, cosmetic services typically are covered by insurance. You don't, you're more likely to have the patient paying out of pocket. Now, there's uh, nothing to suggest that the quality of cosmetic services hasn't, um, hasn't increased at the rate that other medical services might have improved in quality. Now, I don't have the data here for dentistry. Dentistry some, it is sometimes covered by insurance, but it's a little more likely to be paid out of pocket by the patient. I would suspect uh, that uh, dental care has gone up in price more slowly than medical care in general. Um, worth, worth maybe a look. Um, all right, so uh, there are competing standards that go along with those third parties. So the patient then chooses an employer. The employer chooses an insurance company to cover employees. They do this because of risk pooling, which I won't get into here. Or the patient has some sort of um, very weak influence on government. Um, and then the government uh, may pay a care provider through um, Medicare, Medicaid, VA system, so forth. 
The insurance company um, has also a, a politicized relationship with the government. So the, the patient's direct influence over the doctor and, and the preferences the patient expresses to the doctor get lost. So the patient's standards are competing with employers who are the insurance company has, which is uh, competing for employers' business. This very weak, um, more of a theater that takes place with voting. Um, most people seem to be somehow convinced that if they vote, they can really change the system. Um, talk about that later. Uh, government <laughs> regulates the care providers and regulates them some more. Insurance companies lobby government. They really succeeded at this lately, didn't they? They got the government to mandate their services. Isn't that wonderful if you can get the government to require people to buy what you have for sale? And then, of course, the government regulates the insurance companies, and the insurance companies have these efficiency standards they impose on the doctors. So government's paying somewhere around 45 to 50 percent of the dollars that the doctors and the hospitals and so forth are receiving. About 40 percent is coming from insurance companies, and only 10 or 15 percent is coming from the patient personally. So this means that the doctor is, or the hospital is naturally going to give more of an ear toward the person or the group that is providing most of the dollars. You listen to the person your paycheck comes from. So if there's a choice between satisfying the patient standards or satisfying the insurance company or the government standards, which are you going to choose? And of course, you'll choose typically what the uh, group wants that's writing your check. And then we have the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, and, and there, uh, there are def very definitely quotation marks around that because it looks like insurance companies have raised premiums significantly since this act went into effect, and we're still seeing some of the ramifications of that. I won't get into a lot of that here, but it complicates and further distances the patient from being able to uh, uh, express standards to the, um, to the doctor. Uh, this is a <laughs> tragically humorous diagram showing uh, one, one group's interpretation of what the Affordable Care Act would, would do. Um, if, if you can really understand this several thousand page um, piece of legislation anyway. Let me, let me turn now, uh, I don't want to get into this labyrinthine system here, but let me turn now to discussion of national medical care systems. <coughs> if you have a nationalized health care system where the government is directly providing care, you wind up very quickly with a problem. If you tell patients, consumers of any, this would apply to consumers of any good or service, if you tell them you don't have to face any marginal cost for the service that you receive, then if, if, you're, if the price is zero to you personally, why not consume as much as you want? So you will then be consuming a quantity where that arrow is here, at least that's what you would want to consume, even if the cost is very, very high. And notice as you keep moving to the right on the horizontal axis, increasing the quantity that you consume, that supply curve keeps rising. And by the time you get to the point where the demand curve hits that horizontal axis, now we're looking at an enormous marginal cost of supplying that little bit of health care, medical care, that is uh, demanded by the patient. And of course, this is impossible. There's no way that any government could provide medical care to that point, which means that since the price system is not rationing medical care, some other system is going to have to be used. 
So the government then starts to decide who's going to get medical care and who's not. Who's going to have to do without? Now, in some cases, governments negotiate with medical care providers to try to reduce prices as a monopsony buyer of medical care services. If the government says to all the pharmaceutical companies, look, we're the ones paying for everybody's drugs, so we're going to tell you that you have to cut back on your, on your prices or we're just going to buy from somebody else. So the government throws its weight around and sometimes looks at these pharmaceutical companies and says, well, we're going to demand that you sell your, your drug for a much lower cost. And uh, so some countries do this, and consumers in some cases are persuaded to think that this is a good idea. Miller, Benjamin, and North say that a single government agency in each country acts as a monopsony buyer that is a single buyer of healthcare services on behalf of everyone. Individuals are either prevented from buying healthcare on their own or limited by government rules as to what they may buy. Like other monopsonies, these national health insurance systems force down the prices of the goods they buy, such as drugs, medical, medical devices, and physicians and nurses services. Okay, well so far, a lot of people would look at that and say, yeah, that sounds great. Why don't we do that? Well, this in turn reduces the quantities of those goods and services that suppliers will provide, particularly in the long run. If a pharmaceutical company spends $800 million investing in a drug, taking it all the way through the, uh, the labs and the FDA approval process and all of this, and then says, okay, well, the marginal cost once we've figured out the chemical formula for the new drug and we tested it, the marginal cost of mass produ uh, production of this pill is 25 cents a pill. But we're going to try to sell it for $8 a pill. Because remember, we had all those costs that we incurred to develop this. Uh, sort of like telling an architect, um, well, uh, now that you can reproduce blueprints of this new building for a dollar a piece, that's what you should sell your blueprints for. Okay, well, so the government comes along and says, well, it's only costing you 25 cents a pill to make this, so why are you charging $8? This is unfair, this is unreasonable, and all the, you know, all the people say, yeah, this is un, you know, unjust. Well, so the, you can do that to a supplier. You can tell the supplier, we're going to control the price of the good or service that you're producing to make that price fairer. And since those costs are sunk, all those development costs are sunk, the supplier says, well, uh, I guess we'll sell it for you know, whatever you said, 40 cents a pill or something, because it's better than not selling it at all. But the next time they have a choice about whether to invest $800 million investing in a new, a new drug, highly risky market, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, they might decide they won't do it. So in the long run then, you get less innovation. So Miller, Benjamin, and North say the bad news, at least if you are a consumer of healthcare services, is that less healthcare is provided. fellow on the right here is Yuri Maltsev, um, who's affiliated with Mises Institute. I believe he's an associated scholar, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, I think he still teaches at Carthage uh, College. He wrote a great article that appeared, um, it's on the Mises website, you can find it, um, where he says that the Brookings Institution found that Every year, 7,000 Britons in need of hip replacements, between 4,000 and 20,000 in need of coronary bypass surgery, and some 10,000 to 15,000 in need of cancer chemotherapy are denied medical attention in Britain. Well, why is this happening? Because if you're not going to ration a good by price, you're going to have to ration it some other way. And a lot of times, that's by forcing people to wait in line. 
kind of like in the old Soviet Union, you see these long lines of people waiting outside a bakery or a butcher shop or something. And they wait there for hours. There were some calculations of how many hours people spent in, uh, on average waiting in line uh, for various goods. And so you wait for a couple of hours, you finally get up to the head of the line and the bakery shop owner says, or owner says uh, I'm sorry, we're out. So you come back the next day. Same thing will happen in medical care. It does happen in medical care. Um, you know, by the way, in the United States, you can go to a hospital, an emergency room, and the hospital has to treat you by law. Even if you walk in the door and you're bleeding and you say, I can't and won't pay, they have to patch you up by law. Now, I don't want to get into the ethics of all of that, but the consequence of this is that emergency room wait times are notoriously long. They're going to ration by something else. If they can't ration by price, they'll ration by willingness to wait. So it's not unheard of to wait for three hours in an emergency room. Going back to Maltsev here, he says, age discrimination is particularly apparent in all government-run or heavily regulated systems of healthcare. In Russia, which he knows well because he defected from the Soviet Union, in Russia, patients over 60 are considered worthless parasites and those over 70 are often denied even elementary forms of healthcare. In the UK and in the treatment, or in the treatment of chronic kidney failure, those who are 55 years old are refused treatment at 35% of dialysis centers. 45% of 65-year-old patients at the centers are denied treatment, while patients 75 or older rarely receive any medical attention at these centers. In Canada, the population is divided into three age groups in terms of their access to health care, those below 45, those 45 to 65, and those over 65. Needless to say, the first group, which could be called the active taxpayers, enjoys priority treatment. There have been some kind of undercover videos that, um, that you can find on YouTube of people going into Canadian uh, healthcare clinics and trying to get uh, care, and they're, they're told repeatedly, uh, you really, you just need to go down the street to the private clinic. So, Oh, you know, Americans look at that Canadian system and say, oh, it's just wonderful. They get free medical care and so forth. Well, what good is free if you can't find it when you need it? It's free, but far less available. Um, according to the AMA's 2008 National Health Insurance Report Card, Medicare denies almost 7% of its claims higher than any private insurer. This is, this is medical provision by the state. It's less available. And in countries where medical provision is uh, more orchestrated by the state than it is in the United States, and by the way, I'm not holding up the U.S. system as some kind of free market medical care system. And when I compare the U.S. system to other countries, it's a matter of degree. And uh, the Canadian system seems to be moving a little more toward a market while the United States is moving further away from the market. Maybe we'll converge at some kind of horrible middle ground of statism. But in 2006, there were 2.1 practicing physicians per thousand people in Canada and 2.4 per thousand in the US. Canada had fewer nurses per thousand. Uh, oh, by the way, I, should have put the slide in here earlier, but Ronald Hamowy gave a talk here at the Mises Institute several years ago called Canadian Medicare, or Medi uh, yeah, Medicare as a um, model for the United States. I'm not sure, because I haven't rechecked since the website redesign that the Mises, that Mises.org went through um, a few months ago, but uh, I'm sure you can search for that uh, talk and find it on the Mises website. Great talk on um, the problems of, the, of Americans looking at Cana uh, Canadian medical care as some kind of ideal. Medicaid's costs 
like Medicare's, have risen far more than the cost of private health care. And somehow we're going to get government to solve the cost increase problem? I'll skip over some of this for the, in the interest of time, but if you look at the black line there, that's the combined annual per patient cost of Medicare and Medicaid in current dollars. The red line is combined annual per patient cost of all other health care in the United States. Further, more numbers on this, and then I'll wrap up. In 2006, the U.S. had more MRI machines than the U.K. or Canada, significantly more. More CT scanners, and I'm not, I mean, these are proxies, right? I mean, this is a, some kind of proxy for availability of medical care. The U.K. also has higher rates of death from heart attack, stroke, and cancer than the U.S., and Canada has higher rates for heart attack and cancer. But one, of the, one of the problems in comparing countries is that you can't always look at the two countries and find equivalent definitions. For example, in some countries which are purported to have some kind of uh, amazingly low infant mortality rate compared to the United States, well, that's because they don't count some infants who die uh, like the United States would count them. So if you just take that group out of your numbers, then, of course, your numbers are going to look better. Uh, also, we, we may have other differences between the United States and other countries that make our... Uh, uh, life expectancy lower. Uh, we may have, for example, a higher automobile accident rate on state-owned roads, by the way, uh, than other countries. But you can hardly lay blame for any reduction of life expectancy resulting from car accidents at the feet of the medical profession. They'll try to patch you up, but if we have a higher obesity rate, if we have a higher car accident rate, and, and other differences that don't really have much to do with medical care per se, then uh, that could affect life expectancy statistics, particularly since accidents tend to be among younger people who would take that life expectancy figure down more than, say, a 75-year-old uh, who dies of a heart attack. Cancer survival rates are better in the United States. Very quickly, since I've only got a minute left, I'll show you this graph. The wait time for a specialist appointment. Long wait times on the right, short wait times on the left. Notice that in the United States, 74% of adults with chronic conditions who needed to see a specialist saw the specialist in less than four weeks. Only 10% had to wait more than two months. But in countries with nationalized systems like Canada, France, UK, Australia, wait times tended to be much longer. I normally close this talk with picking on the British, <laughs> who apparently are pulling their own teeth out in the shed with pliers because they can't find the National Health Service dentists. I will um, discuss this with you later if you're interested in the, uh, in the de gory details of this. But they literally are pulling their teeth out with pliers when they can't find a state, a, a government dentist. So free but not available isn't exactly uh, ideal. All right, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>